topic today is, is inflammatory bowel disease. So it's IBD, so some people hear IBS, that's irritable bowel syndrome. We're talking about inflammatory bowel disease. And what we'd like to talk about is really help you to understand. I appreciate some of you in this audience probably know more about IBD than I do and, and that many of your doctors know about and, and others are just new to the topic, new to the concept. Some of you are supporting family members with this condition. So we're hoping to give an understanding of what inflammatory bowel disease is, what we know about it, what we don't know about it, and to help you to understand that there are treatments uh, there are treatments that work, there's newer treatments, there's evolving treatments, and it's quite an exciting area with a lot of different options that are, that are coming on in the last few years and we can expect newer options in the years to come. So it's really to talk about that and help you to feel comfortable with it as you support either yourself or your family members or workmates. I mean, some people are dealing with somebody in their, in their work environment that suffers with this and you're kind of wondering what's, uh, what's the deal for them and how can I help them? So that's the topic today. And, and again, we can't talk about everything but I'm a gastroenterologist. I'm, I was born in Vancouver. I, I was a family doctor, and now I do gastroenterology. So if you're thinking you're getting the other GI Joe go, that's not the case. I'm, I'm a gastroenterology GI Joe. So it's a, I'm a gastroenterologist, so I practice uh, this field here uh, for the last uh, 30 years in this hospital, as Gail said. So IBD is an inflammation of the bowel. So we've all got a, a bowel. This is the illustration here. It goes from your your mouth to your bum and it's about 25 feet long and it's a tube and it has a beginning, it has an end. And the tube has, roughly speaking, two layers. There's a lining layer and that's much like the inside of your mouth and then there's a muscle layer and the muscle layer controls the rhythm and the movement whereas the lining layer does the absorbing and the digesting. Uh, and when we're talking about inflammation of the bowel, the inflammation involves the lining of the bowel. So it's inflammation of various areas of the lining of the bowel, and that's what we call inflammatory bowel disease. And, and um, it can cause different symptoms. We'll touch on that. It can cause some real frustrating problems for you and your family members, but it can also be treated. And so the, I hope the message is that there are treatments, and these treatments can be extremely successful for you uh, to manage your, your conditions. People always say, what causes it? We really don't know. So here's a big, busy slide showing that all the different sort of things that you can think about. So genetics plays a role. So my brother has inflammatory bowel disease. I don't have it. So there is a slight increased risk if you have a family member with it, but it's not hugely genetic. There's environmental factors, which you don't understand very well. And in the end of the day, there can be triggers from things that we don't really understand. But most people think of it as being an autoimmune condition. So it's a condition where, for some reason, your immune system is kind of rebelling against the lining of your bowel, causing the inflammation, which then causes the symptoms. And there are factors that can aggravate that. And the one that's very correctable and hopefully is not an issue for anybody in this room is smoking. And so we do know that smoking plays a role and cessation of smoking can be very beneficial. But a lot of the other things that are listed on the slide are really not that well understood. For example, lifestyle, we, we, the best we can say is a good clean living and eat well and be well and be active and healthy. Uh, the role of stress and psychological factors is important, but we don't fully understand that. In the bottom left-hand corner of the microbiome, is there a difference in the organisms that you carry in your bowel when you have inflammatory bowel disease? Are they different than those that don't have inflammatory bowel disease? So there's a lot of exciting research that's, uh, that maybe some of you will participate in the future. There's a lot of unknowns about the condition. The two main uh, inflammatory bowel diseases that we see are Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. And, and we'll, we'll they're different. Crohn's, they both inflame the lining of the bowel, but Crohn's disease can be a little bit more active. It can penetrate through the bowel wall and get into uh, structures outside the bowel. It can affect any part of the bowel from the mouth all the way down to the, uh, to the anus or the rectum. Ulcerative colitis only involves the colon, so it's only the colon that gets involved and it doesn't penetrate through, so they, they behave differently. And then there's always some people that are a little bit, we call indeterminate. They initially look like their ulcerative colitis and then they start to behave a little bit more like Crohn's disease. And so some people get disappointed and say, oh man, now I got both. But you don't really have both. You have one, but it starts to behave a little bit more like the other. So this term indeterminate colitis is a term that's used to reflect that sometimes things can evolve and change over time and behave more like one of the other conditions than, the other, than what it started like. And usually it goes more like, it looks like ulcerative colitis to start with, and then it starts to behave a little bit more like Crohn's disease. It would have been Crohn's disease all the time. 
But some people get disappointed when they realize, oh my God, it's changed. But that concept of indeterminate colitis, I think, is an important concept. The diagnosis is difficult. On average, the studies show it takes about two years to make a diagnosis. So people will say, and some people are disappointed. They say, I've had these troubles for a long time. And, and that's the reality is sometimes the symptoms are a little bit atypical, a little bit confusing to physicians and practitioners to fully understand. And so it can take time uh, for the diagnosis to be crystallized. And the, the usual path is something like what you see here. You have some symptoms, and, and we'll touch on the symptoms. Usually they involve diarrhea or an abdominal cramping and pain. You see a physician, and the physician sort of looks at some basic tests and considers options. Maybe it's an infection, maybe it's irritable bowel, maybe it's different things. And then over time, the tests become a little bit more specific, and then the diagnosis of inflammation is arisen, is arrived at, and then you, you say, oh, now I've got inflammatory bowel disease. But it can take time, and I appreciate that that's very frustrating for people. And there's always the delays that we have in our healthcare system that that uh, aggravate that delay and make it longer and slower to get to testing done that helps to crystallize your diagnosis. And some people then see a gastroenterologist or a specialist, some people see surgeons, some people see internal medicine doctors, some people see nurse practitioners. So there's different health pathways that you can take in the management of the condition of, of inflammatory bowel disease. So ulcer colitis, I said, only involves the colon um, and your colon, and it typically begins in the rectum and then can rise up. So this is an illustration. You can see the rectum at the bottom in blue there, and then it can rise up. So it's much like a high water mark on a post in the ocean. It kind of rises up. And, and the importance of this is that if it's very low down in the rectum, the treatments are often rectally administered. So you give treatments into the rectum, either suppositories or enemas, and they help to resolve that inflammation when it's low down. Whereas when it's higher up, those rectal preparations won't necessarily reach that far up. And so you have to think of alternative treatments. And we'll talk about some of those alternatives that are available to us. So typically ulcerative colitis begins in the rectum and goes up, but it doesn't go into the small bowel, the small bowel being all that pink material in the middle there. Crohn's disease, on the other hand, can, it, can involve any area of the bowel from the top to the bottom. And most typically, it's in the junction between the small bowel and the colon, which is in your right bottom side, so near where your appendix is. So some people then start to come into hospital with abdominal pain. It's in the area of the appendix. And so the thought of maybe you got appendicitis comes up. And then over time, it becomes apparent that there's actually inflammation in that area. And we call that the terminal ileum. And, and that inflammation then is typically Crohn's disease. And so Crohn's disease is a little bit more difficult sometimes to diagnose because it's not is easily visible to a scope or to a camera. And so it sometimes takes even a little bit longer to, to make the diagnosis. But Crohn's disease is, is, um, is much more, a little bit more difficult to manage in some situations. Again, the diagnosis takes sometimes time, it takes time to, to develop. The treatments are quite similar. So some people get sort of fussed. Oh, you know, I'm, I'm missing the treatment from if I've got one or the other. But initially, at least, the treatments are often quite similar. And so you're not necessarily missing the boat if the diagnosis changes from uh, ulcerative colitis to Crohn's disease. The treatments are, are, are often similar at the beginning. And then there's other symptoms. So typically, people with inflammation of the bowel, they have bowel symptoms. So diarrhea, and the, blood, the diarrhea may be bloody. The diarrhea may be associated with mucus and slime. There's often cramping because the bowel is inflamed, and so it's working harder. There may be some swelling in the bowel, so it becomes a little bit narrowed. And then that can give you cramping and pain, the cramping and pain related to the bowel movements. And so that's the typical story, but there can be other uh, symptoms. You can get upper symptoms, nausea and vomiting that can sometimes be a part of inflammatory bowel disease. And then it can affect parts of your body that are separate from your uh, GI tract. And so joints would be a common one. So some people will get joint symptoms and the joint symptoms can be uh, correlated with the activity of the bowel symptoms or they can be not cor correlated. So there can be arthritis symptoms that can be associated with this. You can have skin problems, as skin ulcers, and, and you can have inflammation of the eyes. You can have uh, many different other features. You can get kidney stones can develop as part of inflammatory bowel disease. So it's not just the GI tract that's affected, but typically the GI tract is part of it, and then these other things may or may not uh, be associated. And again, a lot of the treatments now 
for infl reducing inflammation, the same treatments that we use to reduce inflammation in the bowel are also used to reduce inflammation in the joints, for example, or the eyes. So a lot of the treatments then cross over one to the other. But, but some people, the, the symptoms that are outside the bowel can be more frustrating and troublesome than the symptoms of the bowel. But typically the bowel is the initial part of the story and then these other problems can arise later on. And not for everybody, it's not always the case, but for some people that can be uh, a part of their situation. So the, the diagnosis is, is, is developed and, and takes some time and then some people then sort of wonder what are the, what are the pathways that we do? So there's, there's, there's a story, the history taking, the conversation with your physician or healthcare provider, getting the story and making this, this uh, thought, get, getting this thought that, in, that this may be inflammatory bowel disease. There may be some risk factors such as family history that drive it a little bit, but although family history is not that strong or, uh, a risk factor. Physical examination may show some tenderness, some changes in the, in the abdomen that suggest there is, that there's an area of inflammation. And then typically we start moving into tests. And these are not fun tests because these are, these are typically involve stool and poo and nobody wants to handle that. And so there are stools that we, stool tests that we do to look for inflammation. So there's a thing called fecal calprotectin that you're familiar with that measures for inflammatory products within the stool, which is very helpful as both a tool for making a diagnosis, but also as a tool for following the inflammation going forward. And then often we wonder about infections, so stool testing, looking for infection, because sometimes an infection can mimic the colitis. So I was talking to a man today, and he, he has Crohn's disease, and he was in Mexico. He suddenly got diarrhea in Mexico. His Crohn's disease had been quite quiet for two or three years on his treatment. He got diarrhea over one day in Mexico, and then the question comes, is this his Crohn's disease flaring or an infection? And my view is this, he's describing an infection. Suddenly, he picked up a bug. And they, but they can sometimes mimic each other, and often we require stool testing to look for these infections and to, and to to prove that, and then the treatment for an infection would typically be different than the treatment for a flare of the Crohn's disease. Uh, we use scopes, and, and I know not everybody's a fan of scopes, and we have scopes that go in the lower bowel, and that's the colonoscopy. Um, our goal is to make them comfortable. I appreciate that not everybody relishes the bowel preparation and the process and the whole thing is awkward, but it's a very important tool, and it gives a very uh, useful means of evaluating the the inflammation, the extent of the inflammation, the degree of the inflammation. Um, and so it is a very important part of the evaluation in, in making the diagnosis initially and then also for following subsequently. Gastroscopies, that's the camera down in the mouth, are not that useful because most of the inflammation is in the lower bowel and we don't reach that through the mouth, but occasionally there can be issues that reflect inflammation of the stomach or the small bowel uh, high up, and then that's where a gastroscopy can be useful. And then there's a lot of imaging tests from our radiologic colleagues, so we do ultrasounds. Uh, there can be specific ultrasounds to actually examine the bowel, which is quite exciting, uh, but not so readily available. Imaging with CT scans, MRI scanning, um, again, very difficult to get nowadays post-COVID because of the backup of of requests for imaging, but these are extremely helpful tests to do. In the old days, we used barium, and some of you will be of an age where you remember barium enemas and barium swallows, and those are not done very often nowadays, and they've been replaced by these other imaging modalities. But clearly, that combination of imaging by a light, imaging by an X-ray tool, is really an important part of evaluating the diagnosis and then, and then evaluating the progress of the condition going forward. And so this is sort of the, the test pathways that you can expect. And there's a number of blood tests that measure for inflammation. So many of you will be familiar with CRP and sedimentation rates. And these are, again, uh, blood tests that monitor the degree of inflammation within your body. None of these tests are specific. It's not like, oh, that's the bowel test. And, so the inflammation tests are really just measuring inflammation within your body, but they're a very useful tool for you and your practitioner to use to monitor your disease progress. And then we talk about treatment, and there's a whole range of treatments, and I'm not, I can't begin to, be, to describe all the treatments and what's the best treatment for any individual, but I can tell you it's very exciting, the menu of treatments that we have now compared to even a decade ago and certainly 20 to 30 years ago is really quite remarkable and very exciting. 
Um, but the goal of the treatment is to control that inflammation. I wish we could say we could cure the inflammation, but this is like so many conditions that we suffer with. I have high blood pressure. I take pills. It controls my blood pressure, but it doesn't cure my blood pressure. Some of you will have things like diabetes and, and uh, asthma, where we have wonderful medications to control those conditions. But again, none of us can say that we're curing them. And it's the same with inflammatory bowel disease. The treatments are there to control the inflammation, control the symptoms, reduce the complications that could arise, but unfortunately at this point we can't say that we can, can, can cure it, but there's some very exciting treatments that can really improve the outcome and very much improve quality of life and, and um, bring people into a very good spot with their condition. So again, it's, it's a very we try to be positive about it. It's, it's not like the old days, oh, go to bed and don't wake up for another 10 years and come back. That's not the way. We've got treatments, and, and I think it's important to, to access these treatments for you and your family members that suffer with this condition. And the treatments have evolved. When, you know, we used to just say, oh, just make the symptoms go away. That was good enough. But now we're, we're looking at really trying to not only get the symptoms controlled, but also to control the inflammation, to tr try to control the risk of it coming back again. And so this goal of increasing that, that um, in, uh, the, the healing of the bowel is really the goal nowadays. We used to think, oh, if your symptoms are gone, that's good. Uh, and it is good, but it's also, it's better if we can control the symptoms and control the inflammation, control the inflammation that's visible to the scope or to the eye, but also to control the inflammation that's microscopic. And so we're seeing this kind of a, uh, evolution of our treatment goals, which is getting more and more aggressive at controlling the symptoms, controlling the inflammation, controlling the inflammation at different levels from the overt inflammation to the microscopic inflammation and, and healing that wall of the bowel and therefore making it a healthier bowel and less likely to give you trouble and less likely to give you complications or trouble going forward. And so that's really our goal now. And it's really evolved quite a bit. And it's, it's a, it's a, it speaks to the quality of the medications that are available now that we can offer these, uh, these outcomes, which we couldn't before. So again, the goals have changed. It's no longer, oh, just make my symptoms go away. It's, it's more than that. So we've got a lot of medications, and there's simple things that we use. There's some just controlling symptoms, and so we've got cramping medicine, we've got pain medicine, we've got things to slow your bowel down, um, things to control spasming in the bowel. You can try to moderate your diet, your fiber intake to try to change the consistency of the stool. But none of those treatments actually control the inflammation. They're just making things feel better, and they're a very important part of the treatment. But it's, it's not the only part of the treatment. It's really that's the part to try to control those symptoms, which are so frustrating. Probiotics, or everybody asks about probiotics, and there's a lot of excitement about probiotics. And at the moment, I think it's safe to say that we don't really know if probiotics help. We don't know what the right probiotic is, but everybody asks that. Um, the thinking is that there's some mix-up in the, bio, the bacteria or the microbiome of your bowel. So it sounds good, but at the moment it's still uh, really a, a science fiction. Uh, we don't know what the right bacteria should have. We don't know how to deliver it. But stay tuned. I think there'll probably be some exciting news in the future around that. But at the moment, if you've got a probiotic that helps you, great, go for it. But don't, don't keep struggling with probiotics if they're not working because the majority of people, in my experience, don't get a full benefit from probiotics. Uh, but they don't hurt you as a rule. They hurt your pocketbook a little bit, but they don't hurt you uh, medically or physically. So there's an option, but I don't think it's the full treatment. Antibiotics have been used, and, and again, it's the same concept. Let's kill some bacteria. Uh, we don't believe that inflammatory bowel disease is an infection, so there really isn't really a place for antibiotics in controlling it, except in certain circumstances. So, for example, in Crohn's disease, some people will get infections around their anus, around their rectum, and, and those can be very responsive to antibiotics. So there is a place for antibiotics. If people do have infections, like my, my patient from Mexico who has an infection plus Crohn's disease, there may be a place for antibiotics in that situation. But antibiotics are generally not a huge part of the treatment program. There is this concept that you see listed in the, in the bottom, uh, second bottom one, bacterial overgrowth, and that's a subset of people where you get sort of a proliferation of bacteria in your bowel because things aren't flushing through very well. It's a bit like that bit of the Fraser River on the other side of the, 
of the Dees Island Tunnel where you get that slough and it's all kind of green and mucky and you get a backwater. And so your bowel can develop this sort of backup of bacteria in it that then becomes uh, overabundant in bacteria. And so in that situation, some people can benefit from antibiotics to try to reduce that bacterial load. But for general purposes, bacteria uh, or antibiotics are not a major part of the treatment. But again, stay tuned and have conversations with your healthcare provider. One of the main messages which we'll close with is engagement with your healthcare provider. Have a dialogue, have confidence in your healthcare provider so that you can have this dialogue and ask these questions. Is, you know, I read about antibiotics, I read about probiotics, what do you think, is this something for me? And then try to use those, uh, that dialogue to come to an understanding of what may or may not be helpful or useful for you. The first anti-inflammatory drug that was used was sulfasalazine, and that's um, a combination of 5-ASA. A lot of people see ASA, they say that's just expensive aspirin. It's not, it's not aspirin, it's aminosalicylic acid, so it's a bowel anti-inflammatory, and it's an extremely old product. The sulfasalazine was developed 70 or 80 years ago, and, and then it's gotten refined, and so now we use 5-ASA in many different forms. There's many different oral preparations, there's rectal preparations in the form of enemas and, um, and suppositories. These are primarily for people with ulcerative colitis. It really doesn't, the 5-ASAs don't work that well for Crohn's disease of the small bowel. We used to think they did, but now we don't really believe that so much. So, but they're, they're the initial and mainstay treatment for those with ulcerative colitis. Um, steroids, you love them and you hate them. I mean, some of you in this room will have had steroids and you'll realize that they're wonderful for their anti-inflammatory effect, but they're terrible for their side effects. They're cheap, um, they're easy to take, they work quickly, but, and, and they work for inflammation in all different areas of your body, whether it's your small bowel, your colon, your joints, your lungs, that's very good, but they have per certain side effects and, and the side effects are, quite a long list of things. They can affect your mood, they can give you fluid retention, they can give you pimples and acne, they can make you depressed, uh, and they can, in the long run, have effects on bones and, and um, cause uh, bone weakness or bone deterioration. They can have effects on joints and, and um, uh, develop cataracts. So there's some side effects, but as a rule, they're extremely effective. And so when people are really having a trouble with their colitis or their Crohn's disease, it's really flaring. You can't beat steroids as a rule to get things under control. And these can be delivered orally, rectally, or intravenously. Uh, obviously, intravenously would only be appropriate if you're uh, hospitalized. And this is just to touch on, on these rectal preparations. Not everybody likes this, and, 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 you know, but they can be extremely effective at delivering medications right to where the inflammation is. And, and this is just illustrating an enema. So typically these are uh, squeeze bottles. They're 60 or 100 mLs. They're a soft bottle. And this is just illustrating the delivery. You kind of lie on your side in the privacy of your bedroom. You, you reach around, slide the little nozzle in, give it a squeeze, and the medication then lies up into that lower part of the, of the colon, coats the bowel much like a hand cream or a lotion would coat your skin, and that has the anti-inflammatory effects. For those people that have inflammation in that lower part of their bowel, they're remarkably effective. Again, it's not everybody's thing to stick things in their bum, but it can be an extremely useful tool in people that uh, have disease in that area. And that's often all they need is just the, uh, these uh, preparations rectally. And suppositories are much easier. They're like a wax bullet and they pop in and they stay there and typically you put them in in the evening time and they melt during the night when you're sleeping and they coat the bowel. So again, I, I introduce that because a lot of people are appalled at this idea of, of, of putting medications up their bum, but it, it, again, it's a wonderful tool for those people that have disease in that area. And then we move on to other medications. And so there's a whole family we call immunosuppressants. I said beginning at the beginning that our thought is that the Inflammation of the bowel is this imbalance in your immune system. For some reason, your immune system is rebelling against the lining of your bowel. Just like if, you're, if you've got arthritis, it's the lining of your joints. Or if you've got lungs, it's the lining of your lungs that causes asthma. Um, and you get this battle of inflammation. And so you're trying to suppress that inflammation. So we use steroids to suppress inflammation. And then there's this family of drugs called immunosuppressants. And you, you may recognize these as azathioprine or Imuran, uh, methotrexate are the two that are most commonly used. And they've been around for a long time. 
they're, they're slow acting. So one of the problems is they don't work quickly. And so typically you have to combine them with something else. And so typically we use them in somebody who gets better with steroids, gets better with a drug, but then doesn't really stay better. And you need to add something else in there. Uh, they have some side effects. They can affect your uh, liver chemistry, they can cause pancreatitis, a number of different side effects. So they do require some monitoring of the blood typically when they're used. And so again, it's a little bit of a hassle, but they can be extremely useful drugs and have a long, long history behind them. But um, I think the ones that are most commonly used would be azathioprine or imuran. You'll recognize that's that kind of funny shaped pill with it looks like a kind of a donut or a pretzel looking thing. And again, different doses, 50 milligrams, 150 milligrams. So again, talking with your healthcare provider as to what's the appropriate dosing. But they're slow acting. And I think this is a, the main theme with this family of drugs is they don't work as quickly as, say, steroids would work. And when we're going to talk about biologic agents, <coughs> they don't work as quickly as those. So and then we move on to this excitement of the biologics. And, and uh, the, the one that you'll recognize the first would be Remicade or Infliximab. And then along came Adalimumab, and you'll recognize that it's Humira. And they've now there's a whole host of biosimilars of each of these drugs. So biosimilars are basically, you can think of them as being generics, but that term is not used for this class of drugs. But they're basically other formulations of the same uh, molecules and the goal of these drugs is to reduce inflammation so they're all targeting different pathways in that mixed up inflammation cascade so our concept is you've got this this inflammation that's being triggered by some sort of immune mix up in your body there's different pathways in each of these drugs whether they're 5 ASA or whether they're steroids or whether they're immunomodulators or now with these biologics is targeting a different part of that pathway and trying to control that inflammation by, by blocking different parts of those mixed up inflammation cascades. And so the original one was, was Remicade and now a host of biosimilars given by intravenous infusion. So you have to go to a clinic and have it given typically every eight weeks. Uh, different dosings, there's opportunities to exchange, to increase the dose or adjust the dose, either the amount or the, or the frequency of the injections. Uh, the Humera family is given by subcutaneous injections, so it's much like a diabetic would give insulin. Uh, again, very safe agents. We used to th be more concerned about safety, but the safety profiles turned out to be extremely good for these drugs. Rare cases of reactions, but generally not. The concern is that if you have underlying TB, or if you've had TB, it can uh, uh, unmask a tuberculosis infection. Uh, and so hence, the screening for TB is done before you start on these drugs. And if you have a exposure to TB, then often we'll give some sort of a co-therapy to su suppress that TB organisms in your system. But we don't see that very often now. So it's not a common scenario that that's required. Perhaps people coming from areas of the world that have more tuberculosis, uh, that's more of an important issue. But typically in, in Canada, we don't see that very often. And then you see listed there a whole range of other ones. You'll recognize these names. Stellar, we've had that for a number of years. Intivio, and now newer ones. Skyrezi has just come on the market now. And this is the excitement. Each of these drugs is different. They're all coming under the heading of biologics. They're all generally given by injection. Uh, mostly intravenous, but some of them are under the skin subcutaneously, and they're all targeting different parts of the pathway. And so we, we have this huge menu of different opportunities to try to control the inflammation. And the goal, again, is control the symptoms, control the inflammation, heal the bowel wall, and then keep it healed. That's our goal. And, and, and these newer agents are giving us that uh, opportunity. And the, the, the previous ones were all by needle, either intravenous or sub-Q. Now we're seeing oral agents, and you'll, some of you recognize this name as Zeljans. So this is an oral agent, again, a blocking a different pathway in the inflammation cascade, and very exciting and very effective. And you'll see newer, more of these agents coming on. Um, here's listed some of the other ones that are coming on, and, and, and the, the, the opportunity is increasing. Unfortunately, we tend to hear about these things. If you follow these things through social media or through the uh, medical pathways, you'll see, oh man, this is exciting. When can I get it? And unfortunately, the reality for this family of medications is they're extremely expensive. 
Um, and the payers, whether that be the government or your private payers, are somewhat reluctant to always cover these drugs. And so often there's some barriers. The barriers are not insurmountable, but there are certain requirements that the payers want to see met before they'll approve these agents because of the cost implications. And I guess, I guess it's fair, we're all taxpayers and somebody has to pay for them, but, but there, these, these hoops are not totally insurmountable. You just have to kind of, again, work with your healthcare provider, understand the rules, understand the reason for the rules, and then work with them and, and explore these different opportunities that might be available for you with these newer agents. And it isn't to say that everybody needs biologics. The sense is, oh, you got to go to the newest and fanciest. Many people do extremely well with the 5-ASA agents that I mentioned earlier on. Some people do extremely well with the immunosuppressant agents that have been around for years. So everybody's a little different. And again, this is where these opportunities are exciting, but they can be a little bit confusing. You think, well, what's the right one for me? And sometimes you have to go through several different trials to find the thing that actually works the best for you and, and then stay with that choice once you find that that's the best choice for you and for your disease. Um, and so again, typically we use the biologic agents in people that have more severe disease. Typically, we, these are people that have had steroids or cortisone of some form and they, they get a response, but they don't sustain the response. And they're looking for things that can be uh, an alternative to the steroids. Indeed, we sometimes combine them. And, and uh, there's been studies that have shown that a combination of immunosuppressive, so the Imuran or azathioprine that I talked, works uh, it add, adds to the effect that you get from the infliximab and adalimumab family. So often you'll see your doctor or your healthcare provider suggesting start this, add this, and it's kind of a building uh, of these different agents. And that, that's a, a validated pathway to follow in trying to get the best results for controlling the inflammation. Sometimes this can be a bit overwhelming, and all these companies that provide these agents understand that overwhelming feeling that, they, that you and, and your family members feel. And so there's a support programs, and each of the companies that generates these drugs has support programs. These support programs help to uh, develop, get the approval through your paying agents. They help to understand the needs that you have from your uh, insurance carriers. Some insurance carriers want different things uh, on, uh, different barriers that they put up for, for these agents. Um, some of the ones that are injectable, obviously you need to be trained to do the injections if it's something that you self-inject, like the um, Humera family. Um, some of them are given intravenously and you obviously then have to go to a clinic that can, can provide nursing services for the intravenous to be inserted and then to have the drugs given intravenously. And so there's a whole program that's developed to support these agents and their utilization. And some of these support programs add other things too. Some of them will offer dietitian support, um, other different things that you can ask about. So if you're engaged with it, we call them nurse navigators or navigators with these programs, you might ask what other value added do you have to support me with my journey through inflammatory bowel disease? I think the important thing is to remember that it is a chronic condition. And so we're, I said at the beginning, we control the condition and it's very exciting how well we can control it now, but we don't cure it. And, and so the, 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 the early days people say, oh, my diarrhea has gone away, the treatment worked, I think I'll just stop everything. And unfortunately, then many of those people are disappointed when their condition comes back again. Again, it's like my blood pressure. You know, I take my pills, my blood pressure is good, so I'll stop the pills. But guess what happens? My blood pressure comes back up. Those of you who have diabetes, you take medications and your, your sugar is well controlled. You stop taking them and your sugar becomes uncontrolled. And so it's much the same here. And so be wary of that idea of of saying, well, you know, I'm all better now, I think I'll stop everything, because there's two phases of the treatment of inflammatory bowel disease. There's the active treatment, where you're getting the inflammation under control, and then there's a maintenance treatment, where you're trying to keep it under control. And typically, people need more medications to get under control, and less to keep it under control when it is under control. But still, you typically, most people need to be on treatment long-term. And it isn't to say it's forever, 
Uh, many people will burn their inflammation out over time, but typically it's not a it's not a week or a month type of thing. It's usually you're dealing with several years, trying to get it under control, keep it under control, and then have that discussion with your healthcare provider. Would it be okay or would it be advisable for me to reduce my medications or even stop the medication? But that's a a, a challenging discussion sometimes, and oftentimes the conclusion of that discussion is based on what's your experience. If you have quite easy disease to control, hey, you know, I, if I flare, I can get back under control quite easily, then hey, maybe I'll take that chance. But on the other hand, if your disease is difficult and you've had a lot of trouble with your inflammation, maybe you'd want to think several times about allowing yourself to get back into that space again. So you might be much more reluctant to reduce your medications for fear of getting back into those, those uh, difficult times that you had earlier. So again, it's a discussion to have, but as a rule, we think of this as a chronic condition requiring chronic treatment. But, but again, successful treatment. I think the expectation is we should be able to find something that's successful. So then people say, well, what can go wrong? And you know, lots of things can go wrong. I mean, we talk about the problem is basically diarrhea, inflammation of the bowel, and that's enough of a problem, but sometimes other things can develop. So typically in Crohn's disease, where the, the inflammation can penetrate right through the bowel, that, that, that can allow bacteria from inside your bowel to get outside your bowel, and that can then lead to abscesses. And so these abscesses can be around the rectum in the perianal area around your bum, and that can be extremely uncomfortable and awkward. You can get abscesses inside your abdomen where the bowel inflammation can penetrate, and so some people will develop collections of infection inside their bowel. And that can be very frustrating. Uh, it can lead to what we call fistulas, where you get little connections that connect different parts of the bowel, either to the skin or to the other areas of the bowel. And, and again, these can be problems. They're not that common. Um, and these newer agents, like the biologic agents, can be extremely effective at controlling some of these complications. But, but these are the sort of things that can occur in, in the, form of, in the uh, case of, of ulcerative colitis. The chronic inflammation can cause the bowel to become more scarred um, and less effective. We don't see that much now because I think we're much better at treating the inflammation. So these consequences of scarring and, and stricturing that we used to see much more when I started practicing, we don't see as much now because I think we're much better at controlling that inflammation. And by controlling the inflammation, you reduce those risks of, of the scarring and that chronic uh, the effects of chronic inflammation on the body, much like arthritis. I mean, we used to see people with very crippled up arthritic hands, and, and we still see it, And I, but you don't see it as much now because, again, I think we're much better at controlling the inflammation before that more permanent damage occurs. And, and again, it speaks to the quality of the medications that are available for us. People often say, well, just cut the bugger out, you know, do surgery. And, and we used to do that. I mean, it still is a place for surgery, but surgery for uh, bowel disease is not done as much. Sometimes it's, it's, you know, basically mandatory if you've got an obstruction in the bowel from scarring or narrowing, or if you've got an abscess in your abdomen, then often surgery is really the only option in that situation to deal with those particular problems. But that idea of just sort of cutting the bowel away and getting rid of that disease segment of bowel is, is we used to think it cured it because you cut it away, but now we realize that other parts of the bowel can be affected. So there is a place for surgery, but it's not quite as simple as what we used to say two or three decades ago, where we'll just cut it out and it'll all be gone. Um, and so surgery is not done as much now as it would have been done in the past. But there is a place for it, and so don't be disappointed if your uh, your practitioner starts to talk about surgery maybe being an important part of your treatment. It may be for your specific specific situation that it is an important part, but it's not just cut it out and get rid of it. It's more cutting out specific problems like abscesses or narrowings or strictures in the bowel. And again, surgical, surgical techniques have improved dramatically from, from years past. We're also recognizing more and more the role of adjunctive things, nutrition. And I'm, I'm not a dietitian, of course, and, and there's a whole field of, of dietitian support for people with inflammatory bowel disease. 
We don't believe that food causes inflammation in your bowel, but food can certainly play a role. It can play a beneficial role, and it can play a harmful role. So the beneficial role is maintaining nutrition, maintaining a healthy body weight, maintaining a good intake of nutrition uh, with proteins and vitamins and so on to allow your body to heal, and that's very important. And sometimes that requires supplements and, and specific diets. In the old days, we used to use feeding through the vein much more, TPN, you'll be familiar with that, I'm sure, but we don't do it so much now. We try to use the gut, but there's a lot of newer uh, newer methodologies and thoughts on nutritional support. There's some extremely skilled dietitians in the community that can help uh, assess your nutritional needs, your nutritional intake, and then build on that to try to maintain a, a quality uh, nutritional state. Sometimes food can be harmful, and again, we don't think of food causing it, but if you have a narrowed bowel, and then you start to put foods in it that are put a big load on your bowel, and I'm speaking of nuts and popcorn and, and gritty granola foods, often those can't get through the bowel. So it's like a, trying to drive a big truck down your back alley when the alley's too small, the truck gets stuck in the alley, and you've kind of got a problem there. So that's the same thing. If your bowel is a bit narrowed because of inflammation, you may be better off to avoid those high-fiber foods. And sometimes this is troublesome. Yeah, yeah, you got bowel trouble. You need fiber. That's what you need, don't you know? And, and that may be important for some people, but if your bowel's narrowed, it may well be that you'd be better off restricting fiber and, and taking that load off your bowel uh, by, by avoiding some of these trigger foods. And, and sometimes you can figure it out yourself. You know, you're doing well, and then you're not doing well, and you, then you try to associate that with what you've been eating, and you can come to this conclusion that certain foods may be aggravating some of your symptoms. So again, uh, fiber is, is probably the most common one. Uh, milk intolerance, you're no more likely to be milk intolerant if you have inflammatory bowel disease than if you don't. But again, it can be unmasked by having inflammation in your bowel. So just being a little bit more attentive to your diet and looking for things that are perhaps troubling you and then trying to avoid them. So we call that elimination diet. You avoid certain things and then add things, all the while trying to maintain a healthy nutritional intake. And that may require the support of a dietitian to kind of walk you through it and to maintain and to make sure that you're getting proper nutrition all the while. And sometimes people require supplements and calcium and vitamins may be an important part of the supplementation uh, in that situation. Physical activity can be very beneficial. The tendency is I don't feel good, so I'll just go to bed. And, and we try not to do that. I, again, I remember when I first started practicing, people with inflammatory bowel disease would be put in the hospital and admitted for weeks and put to bed. And now we try not to do that at all. The goal is to keep you active, both for your physical fitness, but also for your emotional and mental, mental fitness. You know, you got to get out there and, and try to be part of the part of your family, part of your workplace, part of your school, and try to be as active uh, as you can be, both physically and mentally. And I think it goes a long way towards dealing with the uh, inflammation. And some people need to have some more support, and, and Gail's talked about this get bad gut journal. So some people like to journal their, their disease, they like to journal their symptoms, and you don't have to have anything fancy, but just to kind of keep an idea of, you know, when I'm good, what am I doing? When I'm bad, what am I doing? Is there some triggers that I can identify and I can then change those triggers. So, you know, I hate my boss and maybe my boss causes me. I don't think the boss causes your inflammatory bowel disease, but it may not help it. So what can I do about that? You may find certain foods again that can trigger you and you might want to then modify your diet. And some people find that by journaling, they can, they can come to um, a better understanding of these different triggers for themselves. And recognize that it is a chronic condition. So typically it comes and it goes. So it may come for a lot, it may go for a lot, but the anticipation is it comes, that it may come back again. And we call that a flare. And I think some people are surprised when they have a flare. And again, it's, un, it's disappointing, but it's not a surprise. And, and I think being prepared for that flare and understanding that you have this inflammation and it's quiet right now, but it may come back again. And then trying to understand 
understand what should I do, what strategies should I have in place to try to deal with that flare. And some people know how often they flare. Some people say, hey, you know, I'm good for, when I'm good, I'm good for a couple of years, I'm good for five years. Other people say, you know, I tend to flare every, every winter or every summer, I tend to get some disease activity. Um, so just recognizing that that is a pattern that may be uh, important for you and then preparing for that. And so you can work with your healthcare provider around that. This is in the uh, bad gut material, so on, it's not. Uh, it's in the on the website. So it just sort of speaks to this idea of having an action plan. So you know, if I do flare, what should I do? And you might want to uh, work with your healthcare provider around this. Should I have some steroids on hand? Should I have a, a phone number to call? What should I do if things start to flare? And and a lot of this is around the idea of what we call self-management, sort of you take charge. It's your body, it's your disease, and then develop strategies that work for you, and then in, invoke those strategies when and if your flare starts. And, um, and then try to get that approved or, or agreed to with your healthcare provider, so you're all on the same page. This is what I'll do if I start to have a flare up and then hopefully get a more rapid resolution of the flare-up. And it really speaks to this idea of working with your healthcare provider, whether that's a, a specialist, a family doctor, a nurse practitioner, or the next door neighbor for that matter, um, and trying to work with them and try to understand, help, help your healthcare provider to understand where you're coming from, the issues that you have around your disease, and what strategies can be developed to try to deal with those issues. So whether that means support for medications, and sometimes that's hard because I appreciate many of these medications are expensive. Is there an opportunity to reduce my medication dosing? Are there cheaper alternatives that I could, uh, I could get? And, and how can I use these drugs in a, in a good way uh, without in, in impairing my health outcome? And again, some people have ideas. They say, well, I, the, you, your physician may think, I never thought about that as being associated with your inflammatory bowel disease, but you may think it is. And so have that dialogue. So again, I think having a, a healthy relationship and an open dialogue with your healthcare provider is really important for inflammatory bowel disease, as it is for many other conditions too. And I appreciate the challenges now with the healthcare uh, system in British Columbia and around the world now since COVID, it makes it more challenging to have that relationship. But I would encourage you to try to develop that. A lot of people ask about stress, and it's a stressful condition. It's stressful for you who have it, but it's also stressful for your family members and workmates. Again, we, we don't think that stress causes inflammatory bowel disease, but it certainly makes it worse. And having inflammatory bowel disease can increase your levels of stress and anxiety because you just don't go, what, what's going to happen? Is it? So trying to develop uh, ways to deal with stress, and sometimes that involves using uh, meditation, yoga, whatever works for you. Some people like to talk with psych psychotherapists or psychologists to, again, develop a strategy for dealing with stress and try to reduce that stress and anxiety that may aggravate your disease or may come from your disease. So again, there's resources out there uh, if you can identify them and find them and find the one that's most appropriate for you. Some people do it through self-help. Some people like to do it through professional help. Don't be afraid to to build the strengths that you have with your family, with your work, work uh, mates, and, um, and to use that support to your good benefit. A lot of people talk about cancer. You know, we used to say, oh man, you're gonna get cancer if you've got inflammation of the bowel, and that's not what we think now. And again, I think it speaks to the idea that, that we're controlling the inflammation. So in the older days, when we didn't have such good drugs to control inflammation, you had this chronically inflamed bowel, and the cells start to change, and particularly within the colon, there was an increased risk of colon cancer, and there still is an increased risk. It, it really, it's, the, the risk increases with the amount of your bowel that's inflamed. So if it's just your rectum that's inflamed, your risks for cancer are no greater than the general population. If it's the whole of your colon that's inflamed, your risks go up, and they go up sort of five to 10% after you've had that inflammation for say 10 years or so. But, it, but the, 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 uh, the other understanding now is that if we can control that inflammation, we believe that that risk of cancer is, is diminished. There are some special circumstances where people have diseases of the liver associated with their 
uh, colitis and called sclerosis and cholangitis, and that does increase the risk of cancer of the colon. But that's a quite an uncommon scenario. So just somebody with inflammation in their colon, yeah, your risks go up if you've had inflammation for many years and if the inflammation is not that well controlled. And there are strategies for screening the colon, and, and that's where colonoscopies come in to look at your colon, to look at the the, uh, the lining of the bowel, look for changes in the bowel that might be of concern. But that risk of cancer is not nearly as strong as we used to speak of. And so if you're reading older books about cancer risks, I think you should try to change that to a newer book. Um, and, and again, it, if you're worried about cancer, it speaks to the idea of trying to control inflammation as best you can and to maintain that control as long as you can. And again, it's a, it's a complicated area, and, and it, we, we talk about developing a healthcare team, and maybe it's naive, and maybe it's not really realistic, but I think if you, if you start to build on a, a list like this and say, well, these are things that are important for me, and I can get help for this from that, but this is sort of a, a menu of, we talk about a menu of drugs, this is a menu of, of, of healthcare providers that you might find helpful for you. So it may be a physician, it may be a specialist physician, it may be a nurse practitioner, other healthcare providers, and then you may want to build on that with a dietitian to help support you with your nutritional needs. You may want to deal with um, a mental health provider to help deal with some of these issues that we talked about, anxiety, stress, and, and uh, worry that come sometimes with this condition. You might want to engage your, your family members in this too, so that they can work with you together to develop that support. And then there's specific circumstances where you might want to see somebody about joint symptoms, and that typically would be a rheumatologist. And some people have skin changes, and we don't see that very often, so that may involve a dermatologist. But a number of different uh, healthcare uh, provider opportunities are out there that you can build into your team and try to use them to most effect. I think the ultimate thing is you, though. I mean, we got this team, but I think in the days where you say, well, you know, I'll look after you. I'm the doctor, I'll look. But no, it's your disease, it's your body, so you should look after it. And I think you can do a lot to help that along by being engaged with your disease or with your family member's disease. So understand, what have I got? What, what, what's it doing to me? Uh, what are my test results? What, what test results are, are pending? What test results can I use? What can I do to follow my condition? And how often should I do those tests? Whether they're blood tests, whether they're stool or poo tests, or whether they're scope tests, Try to get an understanding of what's my plan. You know, am I going to do a scope every how often? How often am I going to do blood work? How often am I going to do poo tests? And then collect that information and keep your own file so that if you do have to seek attention and you're traveling or your, your healthcare provider's not available, you've got the information. You say, this is my disease. This is what I treat it with. This is what works. This is what didn't work. This is what I really tolerate well. This is what I don't tolerate. You know, I don't tolerate steroids very well. And, and so let's talk about what opportunities I have if my disease starts to give me trouble. So again, taking charge of your disease, I think, is very important and staying connected with your healthcare provider um, is, is a big part of that, I believe. So again, I, I think it's kind of pertinent for me to say take responsibility, but I think it, it, it really is an important part of it. There's other things you can do to protect yourself, and so we do know that there may be more susceptibility to other infections. We talk about COVID endlessly in the last three years, but there's other diseases that you can protect yourself against that may be more of a problem for you with inflammatory bowel disease. And I'm speaking of flu and shingles and pneumonia. And these each have vaccinations that could be well utilized to protect you from these other conditions that have nothing to do with the inflammatory bowel disease, but can be more of a problem if you've got inflammatory bowel disease. So again, take advantage of these preventative uh, vaccinations that are out there. I think they're safe. Uh, I appreciate not everybody has that view, but I think that most, most of us feel that these vaccinations are very effective and very safe. And again, I speak about smoking, so those of you who still smoke, I would advocate for not. I'm Dr. James Gray on behalf of the Gastrointestinal Society. Thanks for watching. For more information or to donate, visit badgut.org.